Welcome to Inspiring Leaders, the podcast that shares ideas, perspectives, and best practices from great leaders around the world to help you become a more inspired leader. Welcome, everybody. It is great to be with you here today. I am Terry Lepofsky, your host for the Inspiring Leaders podcast. My, my apologies for stumbling all over my mute button this morning. It is really good to be here with you, and I'm finally back in live audio. We are here today to celebrate what's going well in the world today with a very special episode of the Inspiring Leaders podcast. This podcast, as most of our common listeners will know, is brought to you by Ubiquity Coaches. And I have today three other Ubiquity affiliate coaches that are going to be joining us for the show. We're here to talk about what great, inspiring leaders we've been noticing over the past years or over the past year that have been making a difference in all of our lives. So I want to introduce to you each one of the coaches, the Ubiquity affiliate coaches that we've got. We'll talk a little bit about what they're doing, and then we're going to introduce our list of the most inspiring leaders over the past year. All right, let's start this off with a good friend of mine, Dr. Virginie Masana, who is a, an executive and leadership coach based in the same place that I am, right here in Ottawa. Virginie, welcome to the show. It is so good to have you here. Good to see you here on the Inspiring Leaders podcast. Thank you, Terry. I'm very happy to be with you today and discussing Inspiring Leaders from 2021 and, and even before, I think. Yeah, well, thanks for your patience with my mute button this morning. But it's really <laughs> <That happens. laughs> hey, these it's things the story happen. Of we 2020, just roll. repeating yeah. all over. You're on mute. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's probably one of the most common phrases that we've had lately. Uh, really good to have you here. What's been going on in your world? What are you up to lately? What I'm up to, well, you know, Terry, that I'm um, guiding leaders and managers in organizations, but also in a one-on-one -on -one, um, type of coaching. Yeah. So I've been helping several organizations throughout COVID, especially manage uh, change and many reorganizations and restructuring, uh, which has affected their teams and re working remotely. So uh, these days, I'm pretty much involved in a lot of leadership coaching from that um, perspective. I'm an emotional intelligence practitioner, so I'm excited also to talk about leadership from that perspective. And that's what I bring um, into my leadership coaching as well with my clients. I'm also the po uh, host, po a podcast host like you are, but I'm doing this in French. You can probably guess from my accent that I'm French speaking, a francophone. So my podcast is about courage and I hope we can talk about courage today. So may we trade, yeah. Here. <laughs> yes, you your podcast is going really well. What's the name of the podcast? The name of the podcast is Le Courage, so Courage. Um, and I'm inviting guests like you are each month to talk about courage from their perspective in the workplace. So what do they see as courageous acts in their workplace? What do they perceive as being courageous in their career moves or career um, reconversions and things like that? I also have episodes where I give some tools for people to actually build resilience and build courage to take those actions. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. I started be between, I mean, during the pandemic. So between yeah. two waves <laughs> of the pandemic, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, to be able to share and express my passion that way also through the podcast. Well, as you know, I'm a big fan of what you're doing in coaching. I know that you're making a huge difference in so many, difference in so many lives out there. Virginia, I got to ask you, uh, I know that we wanted to get a quote from each one of our Ubiquity affiliate coaches here. What quotation can you share with us today to, to kick off this theme of inspiring? 
It was pretty easy when you asked us ask that to find a quote because I knew exactly who I wanted the quote to be by and what they were talking about. I'm still going to read it, though, because of my English speaking, you know, to make sure I don't <laughs> stumble on words. Yeah. Uh, it's a quote by Brené Brown. Yes. I picked it because it's about courage, um, a topic that's very dear to my heart. And the quote is, daring leadership is ultimately about serving other people, not ourselves. That's why we choose courage. And oh, I, I really wow. love it. And I'm pretty sure most of the leaders we're going to be talking about today actually illustrate perfectly this quote. Yeah, I think that that's a great one. Brene Brown's been a real source of inspiration for me. Great books, great messaging. And I think she's helped a lot of people as well. Thank you for that. Who else do we have who's going to join us here in the Inspiring Leaders podcast today? Coming all the way to us from another time zone, deep in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, Mr. Ed Britton, welcome to the show. It is great to see your smiling face right here on the podcast. Oh, now it's your turn, my friend. I think we're not hearing you. I there didn't want go. you to feel alone, Terry. <laughs> Just trying to be supportive. <laughs> right on. You betcha. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, it, it's, it's exciting and uh, uh, a wonderful opportunity to just uh, share our messages yeah, with your group. Ed, what's going on in your world? You're uh, obviously that's uh, that's got to be a screenshot in behind you there because I can't imagine that there's no snow in the Rockies right now. Oh wow, we're having we're, we're having a sh really nice Chinook right now. Yeah, uh, the, the the hair dryer effect out in Calgary. Yeah, how do you like it? <laughs> very nice, very nice. What's what's going on? You are the not retirement coach. You love working with people in the 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 fifth gear of their life to help them. Uh, find the passions that are really going to light the fire inside of them, right? Absolutely. So not retirement is for stepping away from the job and living big. It's uh, adventure, achievement, and contribution in, in our senior years. And so uh, this is, and what I'm doing right now is trying to get the word out because, well, not retirement is my coaching business, but not retirement is also a movement. It's a cultural movement and it's in the early stages. In fact, we don't even have a common vocabulary mm -hmm. to talk about. You know, you've met, you mentioned the, the fifth gear and I call it not retirement and other people call it advancement and other people say, oh, it's the, the third act and so on. And there's this whole list of right. different words that we, we call this. Uh, I think that just ind indicates the, well, the, the youngness of the, the movement but also the enthusiasm of the movement. Everybody wants in, and that's wonderful. I want everybody in. But because it's young, we still don't have the cultural paradigm shift that we, we need. Right. And in, in order to achieve that, we just have to talk about it a lot. We, we have to be trailblazers and, and demonstrate that um, there's a way to live, regardless of what you call it, there's a way to live that is so much better than the traditional retirement that our parents lived. And so yeah. that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. They, isn't it funny that I've seen the research that shows the, uh, the traditional way that our parents lived 65, you basically sit at home and watch TV for the rest of your lives. It's not a healthy way to finish off your it, life. It, not at all. <laughs> no. Uh, what yeah. quote do you have for us today, Ed? What can, what can you inspire us with the wisdom? Okay. Well, my quote is from, I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not, but it's from Mark Twain. Yeah. Ah, Samuel Clemens. <laughs> right. and, and my quote is, I love this one, age is an issue of mind over matter. Ah. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Mark Twain gets a bullet point on that one. That's yeah, fantastic. That's I've got another one from George Burns. That, that, that's a close second, but I'll okay, sure. for later. Oh, I'll okay. For later. <laughs> okay. Well, let's round off the full set of coaches here, Ubiquity affiliate coaches. We're <sighs> going to bring in a great coach, a leadership coach, an executive coach from Calgary, Alberta. Marco Iafredi, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me. And just, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, when, when you reached out, I'm going, this is going to be fun. Um, meeting Virginie, uh, just 
great energy. And then obviously knowing Ed and you for so long, and uh, as I keep repeating and the broken record, just cherished friends beyond colleagues, just cherished friends. Oh, that's, it's good to hear. Marco, what's going on for you lately? What have you been up to? Um, in, in the realm, and, and my thing is uh, organizational learning, creating learning organizations and operational learning, learning how we do work better from the frontline workers. So right now with me, and uh, there's some executive coaching things that are just on the plate and just about to come where you get to work with leaders, but it's going to be that nice piece of working with leaders to shape their culture for better learning. And and how do we learn from the frontline workers? And with that, um, doing something called learning teams, where a really great, efficient way where you get group of a group of people that are close to the work together, and you start learning about what the challenges are and all these pieces. And then within you can do it within a day to two, and just figure out not only what the challenges are, but how work gets done versus how we plan it. And then actually start coming up with some real solutions based from the ideas from the frontline workers. And then you can drop that into a, a, a bigger set of, we'll call it project management. And um, so this is all inspired by something that I'm passionate about called human and organizational performance and yeah. created by standing on the shoulders of giants, like people like Sidney Decker and Todd Conklin, Bob Edwards, Andrea yeah. Baker, but a phenomenal uh, um, approach to, making better work, safe work, um, just learning from frontline workers and creating amazing learning organizations. So you got know, some of those things coming up shortly. Every time uh, I, I talk to you, it seems like there's more innovation happening. You really do seem to pull out these great examples of how things have been done in organizational learning, uh, organizational development, and you're expanding and growing in that area while you're still doing some one-to-one -one coaching and uh, yeah. in the yeah. leadership and executive space as well. Yeah. So this is really great. We've got, we've got three, well, I'll, I'll throw myself in there as well. We've got four <laughs> coaches here from the ubiquity coaching Alliance. I know every one of you have your own private practice. You're doing fantastic things out there together. When those big opportunities come up, we team up together, we roll up our sleeves and we try to do our best in helping people. Now, this has been a year of a lot of challenge, another year of a lot of challenge, right? The, the global pandemic just seems to be rolling along and a lot of us have been stuck at home for a long time. There have been a lot of people that have been not doing as, as well out there. Businesses have suffered, a lot of people with health issues, a lot of people with stress issues. I think that it's about time that we come together and we celebrate something that's been going really well, something that's been inspiring us. And that's why we're here to talk about the most inspiring leaders of the past year. Let's jump straight into this, guys. Let's start off with our first inspiring leader that we've got from the past year. And that is Jacinda Arden. There we are. Jacinda Arden. Now, Jacinda Arden is, uh, what is she, the Prime Minister of New Zealand? Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Right. What, what makes her inspiring? What is it that comes to mind when we bring up the name Jacinda Arden? I think for me, it was really interesting. And as I uh, um, started to look at a little deeper, just to try to find out a little bit more about these individuals, um, for her, what I found inspiring was you look at her political views and, and from what I got, it's she's left of center. Like there, there's very much that piece. However, um, she's almost like that left of center centrist. And it was she could talk to the other side. And there's there's such poise and thoughtfulness. Um, she's incredibly grounded and you trust her. And I think that's where it's coming from, regardless of the political view, left, right, whatever it is, she's able to earn your trust very quickly from what I've seen on the outside. I don't know what the other uh, panelists think. Yeah, well, one of the one of the things that really resonated with me um, was that she's often criticized for being too empathetic and compassionate. Criticize. And the, yeah, the criticism <laughs> is that if you're too em empathetic and compassionate, you come across as weak. And her re and and I think this resonated with me because I have been criticized in in leadership positions in the same way. Her response 
was as I respond. I'm strong enough and good enough that I can afford to be empathetic and compassionate. I don't recommend it for weak leaders because they're just too weak to do that. But a, the sign of a strong leader of a capable individual is that they can afford to be empathetic and compassionate. I if like you're not that. there, yeah. work on it. Mm. So the, the courage and the, and the, um, confidence, I guess, is a, another word that's coming to mind. That is really what's needed to have that level of leadership. Yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to echo what Ed was saying, because I was thinking of each of our leaders today from an emotional intelligence perspective. And the framework I, I work with has 15 core competencies in EQ. And when I thought about Jacinda Arden, for me, it was evident that it was empathy. Empathy is recognized as one of those core competencies that are required to build an emotionally intelligent leader. And it's often underestimated. And that's also why I use that Brene Brown's quote before, yeah. um, because vulnerability is actually not a weakness when you work with vulnerability in leadership. And I think there are so many occasions recent in the past year, but even before the pandemic, where Jacinda Arden actually showed then when you can show yourself as a vulnerable leader, it can actually lend great results because your people actually resonate with you. They relate to you. They see you as this human who is strong enough to actually recognize also her limitations. So it's not always about doing everything right. It's also about recognizing when you're not doing everything right, when you come from a place of privilege. You know, I one particular scene that I remember struck me when I was watching the news before the pandemic was when they were, you know, those tensions in New Zealand um, coming also from the indigenous uh, communities and how uh, they were mistreated, the way that she showed up, the way that she also went and and became an ally, I think, of uh, visible minorities and making sure that they felt included in how she viewed the country. So how she she brought people together, but also showing her place of ignorance sometimes on certain topics. That's a way of leveraging vulnerability and building courageous leadership. So definitely for me, Jacinda Arden is one of those very inspiring leaders that show how as a leader, even if we, if we are working in a very different place, organization, we can still bring vulnerability and build empathy, and it can be a strength instead of a weakness. Yeah, it's. Uh, I really like the, the warm leadership that she brings to that country. Uh, a couple other interesting points that I found when I was doing some research on her, she became a major world leader at the age of 37, 37 yeah. years of age. And as a woman, as, as a world leader, as a woman, that was a unique thing as well at that point in time. She actually gave birth to a child a year later at 38 while holding mm -hmm. office. I think that this is really a fantastic example that we should embrace and that we should be looking to. Um, and now, of course, if you look around the, uh, the Baltic Sea and all of the countries around that region, uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, there are many, many uh, female heads of state now. And I think that um, she was one of the first. Uh, I think that she's really taken a strong stance against things like uh, gun control is a big mm -hmm. issue for her. Her COVID-19 response was perhaps one of the best in, and obviously this is a team approach, right? But her attention to detail on COVID-19 has really put New Zealand in a very, very healthy spot. So I think overall, we've got a, a great uh, entryway into our most inspiring leaders. What do you think? Should we bring up the next one? Yeah, let's go yep. for it. Okay, let's see who's next on our, uh, we'll bring them up into the screen here. We'll get uh, Greg behind the scenes to flick us on to inspiring leader number two, Dan Price. Dan Price from Gravity Payments, co-founder and CEO of Gravity Payments. What do we know about Dan Price and what makes him inspiring? Well, I have a quote from Dan Price as well that I really, really respect. He said, the problem isn't that unemployment benefits are too high. 
it's that wages are so low, people can work and still be in literal poverty. And uh, Dan Price has, has put action behind his word, words. He, he took a, a pay cut from over a million dollars to $70,000 a year so that he could increase his employees, his employees' wages. And uh, that's, we, we need that kind of leadership from those kind of leaders. That's a, I love that perspective. You know, if you think about this growing divide that seems to be happening in the world of CEOs who are making disproportionate amounts of money compared to the people that are working for them. Um, and then you look at the problems that the world's been facing, especially over the last two years, uh, how many are really stepping up and really putting their their money where their mouth is and putting action into practice? Uh, Dan Price really seems to be one of them. Virginie, any ideas or thoughts here? Yeah, I think, you know, again, from an emotional intelligence perspective, it, what Dan Price did for his employees, for his company, really is about showing social responsibility. It's actually also recognized as a skill that you can work on as a leader. You know, I often think about the, the topic of values. Values, it's something we always talk about in coaching. Whether we guide, you know, people who are not leaders or not, we always explore what are their values, how those values come alive in their project, um, you know, how do they use them as a compass sometimes to move forward and take action? I think with Dan Price, what's interesting is that it can show you that you're actually bringing some values that are extremely dear to your heart, which are related here to social responsibility, and you're bringing them into the organization. So these values do not become sometimes as a cover that you can see on some company you know, a blank, blank, I'm not sure what's the correct word in English. Maybe you can help me with that. But there is an expression like a, a blank uh, statement, I think it is, like a blank statement where you yep. use the values as something that is marketable, but is actually yeah. showing that those values do come alive in leadership. There is a way, it's not just words on paper to be able to describe what an organization is about. It actually leveraged his personal values and integrated them in a common value set to bring into his leadership so that his employees and the people who work for them and maybe other leaders can actually mimic those values, can actually take inspiration from that, can also aim to build their own social responsibility based on what values they want to bring in the, in the organization. So those are the kind of thoughts that were prompted to me when I thought about what he did, because I was trying to relate to how can a leader who is not Dan Price, who is not heading that kind of organization can take away from that, right? What can you do with that? I think maybe there's a reflection there around values that would be interesting for a leader to think in terms of, it's not a blank statement anymore. It's not just a list of things that we nicely package together and that we broadcast here and there, but we actually find ways to make those values come alive in the clear actions we take as a leader. I'm glad you brought this up, Virginia. I think the w some of the things that came to mind for me very much parallel to what you're talking about. Uh, you know, at working with uh, mid to senior leaders for the last 10 years, it always shocks me how many people that I've worked with that have never really taken time to examine their core values. Mm -hmm. And when they do and they become crystal clear on them, really thinking through, how is it that I will embody this value? How is it that I will exemplify this in my actions? That's where ethics, I think, really take hold. And I think that that's what we're seeing is somebody who really knows himself. As the Oracle of Delphi would say, know thyself. This is somebody <laughs> who really exemplifies this. Marco, yeah. what do you think? Any thoughts or perspectives? Just quickly to add, like very much of what Virginia and Ed said there, like this is, a, for me, a very principled person. There's a strong sense of ethics and understanding of self and values and core values. And then just adding to that, putting those into practice, he's an innovator and a disruptor. He, he took the free market system or, or capitalism and just regardless, he was criticized heavily for taking the approach that he did. And he said, he was with the clarity of purpose, I'm going yeah. to do this. And not only that, he proved that it can work. And you really see... Much like Virginie said, it's not a blank statement. It's not a marketing statement. This is an individual that genuinely cares about the well-being of the worker. You just see that value come out in him. And uh, it's 
and how he's brought it into capitalism, so to speak. And he can show that uh, this completely different model can work. Um, it, it was just a, a lot of what was already said, but just adding in that piece of innovator, you mentioned that that's what I was doing earlier. And I, and I just, I love when we have creative thinkers that not only think outside the box, but they're outliers. And they bring these just extra pieces of value and, and creativity and, and mashing it with their value system and just showing you can have this holistic approach that really does work and is viable. And when you look at, let's say, the capitalist system, and not that I'm against it at all, I believe in a free market, socially conscious system. He's thinking long term. It's not just short term payoffs. It is long term sustainability and really applaud him for that. Yeah, and the the hockey stick of exponential growth that's happened to Gravity yeah. Payments. I yeah. mean, their their uh, customer base is, has just grown, exploded, and uh, the profits yeah. are are equally as good. And nobody leaves. Everybody wants to stay. People are crawling over each other to try to get to yeah. work at Gravity Payments. Every time I see a post from Dan Price, there are six, eight, ten thousand likes on it. People like what he says. He's inspiring people. I think that's a great choice. Yeah. Well, he, he doesn't have a, he, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, he doesn't have a brand-focused <clears throat> business. He has a brand-conscious business that's <clears throat> filled with a consciousness in it. it it's, it's real. It's live. It's organic. It's not a facade. No. Yeah, you just feel compelled to follow. You Absolutely. Know, <laughs> he really has that great perspective. Let's, let's move along to our number three. Uh, I shouldn't rank order these. These are not in any particular order. <laughs> they are all inspiring leaders. Let's bring up the next one. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft. Now, are we bringing this up because he is at Microsoft, one of the biggest corporations in the world? Are we bringing it up because he's a billionaire? No, there are many, many reasons. I think that Satya Nadella made our list of the most inspiring leaders of the last year. Who wants to start the comments on this one? Now, maybe I can start by opening with transparency that I knew very little about him. So I did have to do a bit of research <laughs> to actually find what I could, you know, uncover. I mean, I, I come from a place of guessing, obviously, because I do not know the man <laughs> and I do not know the people who work for me. But um, one thing that kind of struck me when I was doing this little bit of background research was and I actually listened to one of his uh, interventions on TV about what he thinks makes a great leader. And he was talking a lot about um, the energy, the energy that a leader brings, right? And when I looked also at his trajectory, his, maybe his energy came from a particular drive for success. Like he's always aimed for excellence. He climbed that corporate ladder and he apparently from what I read, he pushes, you know, his employees to actually strive for excellence, to always challenge themselves, to, to bring that energy also in their work, right? And it made me think again from an emotional intelligence perspective at the skill of self-actualization. It's actually also a leadership skill, right? Like how do you build self-actualization? It's part of self-regard, it's part of how you build confidence also as a leader of how you trust even when you make mistakes that you can learn from these mistakes that you keep your eye on the prize and you continue and you persevere so for me is really this embodiment of perseverance and this energy of perseverance that perhaps it does convey to the people who work for him and i think in certain um, industries or activities maybe this type of leadership can actually be very beneficial it depends probably where you work so i want to kind of temper that down to. I think it can be extremely effective when you work with innovators, you know, disruptors, but also salespeople, because that particular energy is extremely key in motivating the troops, right? In motivating your team. So that's pretty much what I got from, from his style of leadership and how it can inspire other people to do better and, and continue to move forward when things are tough. Well, for somebody who didn't know much about Satya Nadella previously, that was a pretty comprehensive overview. Well, I had to that do more excellent. research. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ed, what, do you, what thoughts come to mind for you? Well, <clears throat> I have, I'm a little bit closer to Satya Nadella because he's actually my oldest son's ultimate boss. My ah. oldest son is a, is a lawyer with Microsoft. Yeah. And 
what we have noticed about that organization, and, and I'm sure it comes down from the, from the top, is that if, if you demonstrate excellence in what you do, and if you demonstrate commitment, uh, you know, and, and, and loyalty to, to, to the company, then they return in kind. And they don't just return in kind in, in, in a corporate or career sense. They will take care of your wife and your children as well. Um, uh, and uh, we're not talking just financial things, but uh, uh, my cute little granddaughter, all granddaughters are cute, <laughs> is a ballerina. And uh, of course she is. Yeah. And, and my son was, was working in, uh, in Southeast Asia, all over the place in Southeast Asia. Um, and, and my daughter had gone as far in ballet as Singapore could take her. Um, and she was kind of done with, with Singapore, right? She's 11 years old and she capped out. Um, she was ac accepted by a da dance school in Paris. And so it, it just, just a lifetime opportunity. And so yeah. my, my son, Jerem said, okay, Zara, you and your mom go to Paris and I'll just do my best to get there. And so they did. They went to Paris and she enrolled in her school there. And within four months, Microsoft had moved my, my son to, to Paris. Wow. So there's a personal exper experience about how this kind of a com company works. Mm -hmm. You know, they take care of their families. Wow. What do you think, Marco? I, I got nothing coming I, I, after Ed. I've got nothing. Like, I mean, how do you how do you follow that? that right? Yeah, how do you follow that? So, no, I just I, like it, it's just the common theme that I, I've seen not only with Satya but a lot of them is there's this blend of excellence and humanity. But one quote that really st uh, when I was doing my research and I like Virginia, I got to admit I didn't know too much about him, so I had to do some extra research. But um, there was something that stood out about clarity and creating clarity where none exists. And then just going back to the innovation piece, you just think of just an incredibly creative, brilliant, open mind that's just going, let's just explore possibilities for the sake of exploring. And I know growth mindset is a huge part of, of, of what he follows and embraces and guides. But it, it just that little piece there just got me thinking of how does this person view not only creativity, but mistakes? And he probably mm -hmm. leaves... Um, space for and actually going back to human and organizational performance. Two of the founding principles are there's five key principles. So the first one is errors are normal slash mistakes will happen. But more importantly to that, blame fixes nothing is the second one that immediately follows that. And if you go through all five, learning is essential, context, environment matters. But then the, the last one, number five, response matters. And particularly from leaders in the sense of how do you respond to blame? How do you respond to failure? How do you respond to mistakes? And I get the sense that this is a guy that's, if, if you threw something out and you tried and you swung the bat, that's fine. But you tried. Did you learn from it? And how do we move forward and innovate? So just adding to the pieces there, it just really stuck me, struck me that this is a person that is not only an innovator or creator, but someone that probably embraces mistakes and failure in a different way and allows his people the space to do the same, done in the right context. Yeah, I think that's a great summation. I'm glad you touched on the thing about uh, growth mindset because that's what I've seen. You know, coming from those Steve Ballmer years where there was this complacency, it seemed, little innovation coming from Microsoft. Then Satya Nadella comes in and he really tried to shape that culture. He tried to shape it um, with that growth mindset, that book, uh, from uh, Dr. Carol Dweck called Mindset really comes to mind. They really started to embrace lifelong learning, innovation, creativity, learning from mistakes. And here we see things like the Microsoft Surface come out, OneNote, of course, Microsoft Teams, which has touched all of our lives. The innovation is really rolling again. And I think Satya Nadella has made Microsoft 
extremely relevant all over again. And it's amazing to see an icon like that rise back up right to the top of people's mindset and one of the top two most valued companies in the world right now. Um, let's move on. We're, uh, we're, we got to get on to our next one here. Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg, Swedish environmental activist. This is the youngest of all of our inspiring leaders that we're covering today, 18 years of age. Who's got some thoughts to throw out this one? Well, I have a short thought directly from Greta that I think says it all. Uh, she, she said, I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. Oh, <laughs> love it. 18 years of age, and here she is, one of our most inspiring leaders. What a great quote. Yeah, and you know, Greta is not only young, but she also she also struggles with significant mental health issues. Yep. <laughs> and in spite of that, she's a world leader. With, I, without corporate backing, without, yeah. uh, you know, this is just pure passion coming from her. The P, And just layering on top of what Ed said there, and she's... Uh, um, been open about the fact that she's on the autism spectrum. I don't know if they're still using the term Asperger's anymore, but from what I understand, she's brought that term out. And then selective mutism only speaks when when compelled to. When you look at all of those factors together and just the courage to put herself out there with respect to that, regardless of whether you agree with her views or not, beyond inspiring, it's, it's just of what's possible. Um, and when I was doing some research on her, when she saw her family, like you go back to the mental health challenges that Ed was talking about, there was severe concerns about the world. And then when she saw her parents and she engaged with them and just taking small little actions, she got that sense of hope back. And it's, it's just amazing how when you look at all of this stuff, how she in her own way inspires hope. Well said. Yeah. Virginia. Yeah, I, I want to add also that she's been very much criticized too like she's been attacked they've, they've oh, been some yeah. very mean comments about her like she's been attacked from all sides and from very powerful white men you know who are not Privileged. afraid to use their voice also to create damage and i think what inspires me the most from her is the use of her voice so and and i think there's a whole set again in emotional intelligence that's about self-expression how do you stand your ground how do you affirm yourself in a respectful, responsible, but firm manner? And as a leader, this is extremely important to possess. There are some very difficult decisions sometimes that need to be made. You also have to stay true to the course. You've got to have some flexibility, of course, but sometimes you need to set the boundaries. And I think that she exemplifies that perfectly. She has so self-assertiveness. Assertiveness is key in emotional intelligence and for any type of leadership, honestly. It contributes also to building your own confidence. And I think that's honestly what inspires me the most from her. Like it's, I, I think she is pretty rocking awesome at doing that. No matter what comes her way, she stands her ground. It's yeah. like, you know, this image in Lord of the Rings when Gandalf is like standing his ground and he says, you shall not pass. Well, yes. this is what assertiveness is. It's not about name using. It's not about um, using those very negative comments and attacks that she's been on the receiving end. She's been using her voice in a respectful but decisive manner to speak her truth. And I yeah. think that's yeah. pretty awesome. And it's not impulsive and it's not... Uh, you know, just winging it. This is well thought out, well reasoned, mm -hmm. and extremely deeply grounded in ethics. Absolutely. And uh, here's this thing that we talked about before with Dan Price. It's coming out again when we talk about Greta. It's that ethical discipline that really uh, creates that, takes that little um, that little uh, pilot light inside of her and turns it into a flamethrower. And that's where I think where a lot of her courage comes from. Great comments, you guys. This is great. Okay, let's let's move on to uh, a company that just posted, I think, one of the most profitable three-month periods uh, for any company anywhere in the world in the history of business. $124 billion 
in revenues for the last quarter for this company, Apple. And here's their CEO, Tim Cook. How do you follow Steve Jobs and step into his shoes and become a CEO? So we've seen Tim Cook now for 10 years, a little over 10 years, and he's been at the helm of this company and has taken it exponentially into the stratosphere as far as corporate earnings, as far as uh, users and the rest of it. But what do we have to say about a guy named Tim Cook? Th this one was an interesting one. When I did a little digging around on Tim Cook, like uh, one of the immediate thoughts was, okay, why would Steve Jobs pick this guy? Because he's he's not going to be, when you talk about, uh, th th there's going to be some emotional intelligence and whatnot, but this guy is going to be no nonsense. Like that was just my thought. And, um, so let's dig a little deeper. And it turns out like he's got a routine where he wakes up at 3.45 in the morning, um, starts checking emails. He works out in a gym that is separate from the, um, from the Apple gym. And uh, beyond that, and just so, some of the things that uh, someone goes, you're in a room with him, he'll ask you, and you better be prepared. You better be. So there's elements like discipline and focus uh, just to the next level. And they said, if he asks you a question and you're prepared, he'll ask you 10 more. If you're unprepared, he'll ask you 20. And if you don't, and the person said, there was one person that came unprepared and he goes, okay, you basically, you're fired next. And then another with uh, respect to Apple and they weren't performing well in China. In the meeting, he, uh, from, from what I saw, it said, we need to have someone on the ground there. Like, this is not right. Half hour into the meeting, he looked at one of his executives and said, why are you still here? The guy got up, walked out, got a one-way ticket with no luggage and went to China. It's just, this is a no-nonsense person on steroids. But at the same time, spends time at lunch, having lunch with different people in his group. So he gets a sense of his people and what they want and when he checks his emails he's really trying to understand the customer so he's really trying to connect and and i don't want to even use the word develop rapport but really just connect with who his people are and what his customers want so there's that sense of it's not from the top but how do we learn right from the front lines yeah i think the most being the most powerful or the most profitable company on the planet a uh, hugely influential uh, company there's a responsibility, I think, there to keep it driving forward, keep it moving. Extremely high expectations. Um, it's he's, his um, ambition and his drive are extraordinary, and I think that that's really one of the. It's got to be one of the keys to why Steve Jobs nurtured him. And I got a quick story for you guys. Um, I was um, I was at Apple at the working at Apple at the time um, when the transition happened. And uh, I was actually training in Cupertino at their head office. And at one point in time, one day, this, this is a true story. I looked out the window and there were the two of them out in the sidewalk walking along. And I can only assume what was happening. That was coaching. There was a coaching moment happening between Steve Jobs and uh, Tim Cook. And uh, obviously that, that combination has worked really well over the years. What do you think, Ed? What, what's the secret recipe that makes this guy an inspiring leader? Well, you know, one of the, one of the impressions that really struck me is one of his favorite quotes is, be the pebble in the pond that creates the ripples of change. And when, when I heard that quote from him, I immediately thought of Greta Thunberg. And I thought these two people who are so different and are leaders in such different environments are really talking the same language. They believe and, and exude the same principles. And so we were, we were talking a little bit th about this, uh, you know, before, before we started, but there are such common competencies in these leaders that they just almost scream at you. If, if you intend to be a leader, it's no secret what, what you need to be. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, it's like there are certain laws of physics that guide you to, 
to significant leadership. Another thing I wanted to say about Tim Cook is that he is the first of the six out of 10 leaders we are discussing today who's over 60. In other words, 60% of these remarkable pe people, what we're saying are the 10 best in the world, are at an age when a lot of people are checking out into traditional retirement. So yeah. if you really want to do the best that you've ever done, if you want to be at the top of the game at any time in your life, what these people are saying is the top of your game is going to happen after you're 60 years old. <laughs> so but for heaven's like sake, don't check out. You're, you know, you're most of the way up this mountain. And so don't stop now. Your greatest comp contributions are yet to come. Oh, I love that. I think that that is a brilliant, brilliant commentary on what we're seeing, uh, especially from him. Tell you what, let's flip this from the high-tech company in Silicon Valley to the fatherland of Germany. Angela Merkel, our next inspiring leader, um, the Chancellor of Germany. And nearing, as interestingly enough, Ed, nearing, nearing the end of her career as well. Uh, definitely somebody who has really not inspired just us, but I think inspired pretty much every world leader out there. She is the irrefutable leader of Europe. All other uh, uh, nation leaders look to her. They seek her advice. They look to see what movement she's going to make first. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Angela Merkel. So I wanted to know, I'll just jump in here for the short comment. I want, wanted to know what is next for Angela Merkel, uh, because I, I'm, I'm sure she's not done yet. <laughs> and uh, so what she's doing now is reviewing, she's going into a life review and doing one of the things that in the Not Retirement program we recommend, she's writing her autobiography. She's looking at the high points in her political life and saying, this is what I learned and have to contribute to the, the leaders coming up so that they can perhaps have similar kinds of success in, in their life. Um, yeah, so Angela Merkel has a big job ahead of her extracting what she has learned and offering it to the rest of us. Hmm. Maybe I can jump in here. Um, you know, earlier on, I was talking about assertiveness um, for Greta. I think Angela definitely has that. You know, she's been renowned to stand her ground also to make those tough decisions. So you see several of the EQ skills actually come alive in her type of leadership where she has that confidence, she expresses, she uses her voice to make those decisions. She has impulse control. She has reality testing that helps us actually make those decisions, even in spite of, you know, critiques and so on. But above all, what really inspires me um, from that particular leader is her resilience, her ability to um, build stress tolerance. Honestly, she's had a very tough life way before her political career. Like if you read her biography, like many different stories about where she comes from and how she had to build herself. And it's pretty incredible to notice that she was able to increase all these other skills that I mentioned before in the face of extreme hardship in the face of many challenges, individual and collective. So I think she definitely is a picture of inspiration for anyone who is struggling right now and thinking that change is very hard to navigate. There are many learnings to get from Angela Merkel from her, her life, honestly. So I think stress tolerance is probably what I find most exemplary about you know, her. She built, built resilience. Virginia, I've got to say, um, your your comments, uh, you bridged back to something that you said earlier about Greta. Uh, I'm going to throw a comment up here on the screen. And this comes from uh, one of our colleagues, Lucille Osai. And uh, she said, yeah, great comments, everybody. 
Uh, love Virginie's comments on Greta, especially the point about assertiveness and decisiveness. So yeah, yeah the resilience you, is important. The, the, uh, there are these key elements to come back to what Marco was saying before. We can almost pinpoint several, a, a list of things that despite the unique nature of every one of these leaders, these are things that we can, we can draw out from almost every one of these. Mm -hmm. Marco, any comments here about Angela Merkel? Very quickly, and just kind of tying everything that we've said here together, that uh, the, the list of qualities and resilience, stress tolerance, innovation, emotional intelligence. I'm just going to use one word to describe um, um, Angela Merkel, fearlessness. And uh, when I was doing my research, or I keep using that term, or just looking deeper in, it turns out she studied, She not only has she studied chemistry, but it was quantum chemistry and chemistry was the one subject that she failed in high school. So that just gives you a little insight into the individual of, I didn't shy away from failing from chemistry. I'm going to master that. And, and when we talk about leaders, there's that sense of mastery um, beyond clarity of purpose and the ability to fail and move forward. But I just found that really fascinating that went on and got a PhD in quantum chemistry. Let's wow. just, I remember in university, inorganic or organic chemistry were hard enough. I can only imagine what quantum chemistry is like. And to hear that she actually failed chemistry in high school and then went on to do that just, just gives you an indication of the type of person that she is. And fearlessness is the word for me that embodies it all. I, like I, that I agree 100%. Fearless yeah. is the perfect adjective for Angela Merkel. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for that. And I'm going to... Use that term again for our next inspiring leader here. Uh, the, his, his real name, Tenzin Gyatso, more commonly known as the 14th Dalai Lama. This was my pick. I threw this one in there. I have such enormous respect mm -hmm. for this individual. Uh, how, many, um, how many spiritual leaders out there can fill a football stadium with people when they show up to speak. This is the kind of guy who truly does inspire a lot of people. Um, I'll give a, a little bit of background on this one before we start. This is a guy who became a world leader, a leader of his country at the age of 15, back in the 1950s. Only a few years after that, the uh, communist uh, party in China moved in and basically took over his country. And uh, he basically fled his own country and has been living in northern India in exile ever since. He's since given up his political title, but still retains the spiritual title, the spiritual leader of the Buddhist community. Uh, his, the backbone of what this guy does, it has to do with compassion. It has to do with, with deep, deep empathy plus action. And uh, that seems to be the thread that has taken him all the way through uh, his entire life. He's now in his uh, mid 80s, I believe, mid 87 or something of that nature. Uh, obviously not moving around too much because of the pandemic these days, but just so inspiring to see this guy continuing to speak, continuing with the same message, inspiring so many people out there to adopt what I think a really, really healthy way of life. Any comments from our panel at all on, on the 14th Dalai Lama? Now you made a pretty brilliant uh, introduction to an amazing man. Um, it's funny you started by saying that he, feel, he feels, you know, a football stadium, because I was one of those people in a football stadium actually coming to watch him more than 15 years ago in Ottawa, when he, he came to Ottawa. And you know, beyond the empathy, the social responsibility, all those skills that I've already mentioned before, there's one thing, you know, I was thinking about that yesterday, talking with my husband, you know, what do I actually admire the most among all those things? And something funny kind of came up for me was his optimism. And you know why? Because I remembered clearly when I was in that football stadium that the guy was hilarious. The guy was making jokes. He has such a great sense of humor. And I don't think that's what is being said the most about him. But I think it's pretty amazing as a leader to actually use your sense of humor to nurture optimism, right? And see the glass half full instead of half empty. And we all know already all the challenges that the, that, that the Dalai Lama had in his life, right? So 
being that optimistic wow you know like <laughs> this is pretty incredible you know still being able to joke and bring that sense of hope and optimism and humor to other people i think that's what i love the most about him honestly and this is probably what is less known about him yeah it makes him uh, enduring in to all of us and uh uh, just irresistible to a lot of people too. Any other comments, folks? Oh well, you know, I uh, again, I, I feel, I feel a little bit of an association with uh, Ten and Gut. So because I actually lived in China for for ten years, and uh, it's a little bit like my my second home. Um, if anybody has reason to be angry and offended and cheated and feel vindictive, it's got to be him. Yeah. And yet there is not a drop of any of those vices in him. And so whenever I start to feel a little bit that way, you know, I'm, I'm not Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I think, you know, I think of him and I think, Ed, what have you got to, you know, what have you got to complain about? <laughs> you know, and I just have to let it go because yeah. heavens, nothing like what he's got. Yeah, he seems so, to exemplify a lot of qualities that are very healthy ways to live. Letting yeah. go of anger and resentment and uh, no, never holding a grudge. Forgiveness is a big issue for him. And uh, um, yeah, you don't see him get angry very often, do you? No, and, you know, I kind of think that that's what's coming out. One of the things that are really is really coming out among these leaders is that it's not just words, mm -hmm. that the way they live is authentic to the words they speak. Yeah, um, that that has just got to be that kind of integrity has got to be a core principle of being an elite leader. Yeah. All right, we're going to move along for time's sake here. And uh, Ed, I think you may be timing out at some point in time. I'm not sure if you need to let uh, to take part of us here, but um, uh, let let's move. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, I'm okay. Oh, good. Let's look to uh, Catherine Jansen from Pfizer. My goodness, we all have a thank you to offer Catherine Jansen. Let's uh, maybe who who'd like to introduce a little bit of background or context on Catherine wow. Jansen. Just the one thing, just trying to learn more about each one of these people and just saw a piece on here where with the pandemic, made it, she made a statement like, I took this very personally, nothing else mattered. And going beyond, going back to these qualities that all these leaders exhibit in terms of clarity of purpose, drive, um, there is just something about that statement and humanity. We just we just had the embodiment of humanity, humility just before this, the Dalai Lama. Um, with that that statement alone, it just you just try and find these statements that kind of describe the individual and, and speak more to the just what the words are. That this became something bigger. This was about how can I be of service to humanity? And when you look at the commonality of all of these leaders. In some way, in their own way, they are trying to be of service to humanity. And with that word hope again, they instill hope in their own individual way. You may agree with it, you may not, but they are true to who they are in terms of how they express their humanity, their humility, their hope. Um, and, and this that statement just, it just jumped out at me that this person, and you also look at her background, um, another fearless leader, uh, the HPV virus and the development of that vaccine, constantly being told, no, 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 don't put, don't go there. Money, um, just the, re and she chose to buck the trend much like Dan Price and do things in a different way and look at the result. And she has a track record of taking difficult challenges with respect to viruses and vaccine development and developing them and showing a track a track record of success. So it just gives you an idea of this person and her diligence, her creativity, um, her innovation. And, and more than that, that statement of, I took this very personally and nothing else matters, how much from the outside looking in, obviously not knowing the person, how much she cares about taking care of the well-being of people. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, for people who don't know her background, uh, head of vaccine research and development at Pfizer, a uh, team of 650 experts uh, developing um, the life-saving vaccines, including the one for COVID-19. And now I believe they've got another, um, uh, not not a prevention, but more of um, something to the pill that's going to lessen the symptoms. Okay. Right. So um, absolutely key for the problems that are really affecting everybody around the world. Any more comments from uh, Virginia yeah, or Ed? Yeah. I, I wanted to add something, you know, when I, when I was thinking about what I find inspiring in this particular leader, I don't think it's about what she did or her title. And I think it's actually a great reminder that leadership is not about status, but it's about how you're a great team player. In order to achieve the results that she had, she was a great support for her team. She Good was a point. true team player. Yeah. And I think it's extremely important to, to kind of highlight that, that in order to be a great leader, you need to actually be there for your team first, to listen to their needs, to make sure that they have everything they need to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're under pressure and there is a sense of urgency like theirs with a race for the vaccine, right? So I, I, I that's actually what I want to re remember from her type of leadership, how, wow. you, Good how point. it is important to be a team player. Yeah. Marco? I think you want to go to Ed. I just uh, I started. Oh, song, sorry. But I and, and just to, to yeah, You're absolutely. Right. Being the team player, a, a yeah. great leader is someone that draws out the best in the team and yeah. and puts the team before them, so to speak. They shape the culture of the people. Yeah. You guys all have your vaccines. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Ed, any comments on this one? Well, just really briefly. Um, and I don't want to make this all about age, but Catherine Jensen is 64 years old. Oh, I and didn't know that. Time, yeah. At a time when most people are thinking about how they're going to check out, yeah. she's at the top of her game. There's and a good this example. might not even be the top of her game. Uh, so, yeah, just again, for heaven's sakes, don't check out when you're at <laughs> or close to the top of your game. Yeah, good. a good reminder. You know, all that experience... Um, all of that knowledge, um, all of the the life experience that builds the ethical standards and the drive to, uh, I think that that's a fantastic point to remember. Really good. Okay, we'll move on. We've got a couple more here. Uh, the next one, uh, again, not to keep throwing billionaires up there, but this guy has been uh, one of the most inspiring people on the planet now for decades. Richard Branson, knighted as Sir Richard Branson. Uh, founder of the Virgin Group of Companies, the Virgin Empire, over 400 companies. Um, but we're not here to talk about him being inspiring because he's wealthy. Uh, what are some good reasons to cheer on uh, Sir Richard Branson? Well, I wanted to know what uh, Richard Branson was doing now. He's done so many amazing <laughs> things. So... His latest is to step up in front of the business leaders of the world and uh, to, to call them to defend democracy in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine. And so again, that social responsibility coming forward. Um, again, somebody who's using his, his vast wisdom gathered uh, through a long life to to speak for what's right and um, to speak truth to power. Uh, and Richard Branson is somebody who can speak truth to power and also who can speak power to power. And uh, it's so, so wonderful what he has chosen to do at this moment, this critical moment in the history of the world. Uh, you know, I got to say, I really like seeing him getting up into uh, into the atmosphere and uh, beyond and into space. Uh, because this guy has really been, uh, you know, leading at that distance for so many years. I think back to when he and Nelson Mandela co-founded the elders. And if anybody here doesn't know 
uh, any of our audience doesn't know what the elders is, please look it up. This is a group of former world leaders that are really helping guide the, the ethical standards of the planet. They're really the ones calling for action on certain topics. And it really all started from Richard Branson and Nelson Mandela. So, uh, you know, a tip of the hat for him, absolutely. Yeah, I don't have much to add, except that when you think about Sir Richard Branson, you, the best word that comes to mind is visionary. You know, the guy has a vision, <laughs> same as when yeah. we talk about values all the time in coaching. Uh, vision is often the word that comes up. Also, what's your vision? You know, how do you visualize? What's the end game? You know, not to use Ed's, uh, you know, <laughs> theme on it's not the end. There's still something to go beyond that. Well, the vision also is is thinking beyond, you know, retirement. I think it's also part of how to think beyond, you know, um, age, you know, would be vision is something else. It's supported by value, it's supported by drive that doesn't stop because you've stopped working in a particular business. Yeah, but I think he should ways, be the poster child of Ed's business for sure. Yeah, I guess, eh? <laughs> if I'm not the target audience yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but visionary, I mean, the guy, you know, with what he launched, I can't remember the name again, like his um, to go into space as well, or, you know, like in, in the race also for space against all these other big powers and big names, you know, um, the idea he had, the vision he had also for that. He's the perfect embodiment who's, of someone who is future oriented. So the perfect candidate for coaching, honestly, yeah. <laughs> someone who is not always looking back, but who is trying to imagine, you know, what's the next best thing to have this vision come alive. So, yeah. I, I don't have much else to add other than I think he's the embodiment of all the leaders that we're talking about. You put them all together and you yeah. get Richard Branson, the, That's right. the visionary servant leader, fearless disruptor. Like he's, he's all of those things. He's creative and look at his business ventures. And then you look at his humanitarian efforts and with world leaders and whatnot. He's just, you put all the leaders together and you get Richard Branson. Yeah. I got a funny story about Richard Branson, a close friend of mine, um, Peter Clark, who's um, the um, founder and CEO of Red TV based in Calgary, where you guys are from. Um, and uh, Peter Clark went to Necker Island to meet Richard Branson on his private island and spent, uh, I think, about a week or so there with him. And uh, there was a video that Peter showed me of some of his interactions. I mean, there were photos of the two of them, like playing guitar and laughing like you wouldn't believe. But one video in particular that always stayed in my mind, it was, um, they, they decided that they were going to have a meeting. All of the people that were there on the island for that week, they were all going to have a business meeting, but it was going to be on one of the other islands that was just a little ways away from Necker Island. But the game was, which Richard came up with, you have to figure out how you're going to get to this other island for this meeting. So everybody took a different way of getting there, a different means of transportation. Peter was on one of these uh, Hobie cats, you know, the uh, with the two uh, hulls. Then they're going along with the sail up, and they're sailing between one island and another one. And all of a sudden, from the distance, and Peter had the good sense to pick up his camera, his video camera, and record this. Way off as a dot in the distance, they could see something approaching them very quickly. It was Richard Branson on a jet ski. <laughs> and he started buzzing this Hobie cat and spraying them with water and laughing at the top of his lungs. This is a guy who's never let go of that element of play. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that also I think stays with me. And I think it has to do with uh, his entrepreneurial nature and his ability just to look at things and say, why not? Why not? Okay, uh, let's go to a good friend of the Dalai Lama's. Actually, believe it or not, one of his absolute best friends who just recently passed away, mm -hmm. um, the Archbishop Bishop of South Africa, uh, Desmond Tutu. Any, any comments from the panel on this inspiring leader? Other than he's the embodiment of the servant leader. He mm -hmm. just, it is the person who is of service to other people, the sense of humility um where it's not about personal gratification it is to be of service to other people like that's just the one thing that anytime i've seen uh desmond tutu speak where it was just this is a humble and much like the dalai lama has a lot of reason to be angry and isn't 
uh, that servant, loving, compassionate leader. Yeah, not an ounce of ego in this man, is there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it it speaks to the to the principle that strong leaders are strong enough to be empathetic and compassionate. And I, I, so, Southern Africa is another place where I've lived for a long time. Where have and, you not lived, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> and Desmond, too, I, I know personally, I've experienced personally um, the, the force, the, the total government force and push that was against him. And he had no reason to believe that he would ever be successful. Mm -hmm. But he was the same person in spite of that. That that kind of disadvantage didn't change him. And then and then when the paradigm, you know, the leadership changed in South Africa, he was still the same person. And so the integrity of principle that he demonstrated in both of these different environments was perfect. Um, and I, I go back to one of the principles that Stephen Covey teaches, and that is that the inner victory, the private victory, precedes the public victory. And so if we achieve this inner private victory, then the externalities, the, the things that are contingent and ephemeral around us do not need to, and in fact will not, impact us. Mm -hmm. We will be the same leader in spite of all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking too, um, I, I love what you just said. I was, you, you brought to mind some connections, connecting the dots between a few people. Desmond Tutu kind of was the only one really that um well there were many but he was the one that really stepped into the limelight after nelson mandela's passing and he carried the torch for the fight against apartheid and uh really led the the soul of that nation and i think that it was just um he continues to be this inspiring um or, or until his passing just recently continued to be this inspiring leader that really kept a lot of hope alive, kept a lot of act, action happening towards positive things. But it was the connection between he and Nelson Mandela. And I realized just as you were speaking, um, that connection to Nelson Mandela, also if you connect those dots back to Richard Branson, starting up the elders with uh, Nelson Mandela, I think if you start really looking at a lot of these folks, um, you know, Desmond Tutu being best friends with the Dalai Lama, there are a lot of connections in between these people. And I think inspiration does become contagious. And when people are feeling that um, the power of uh, the influence that comes from inspiration, I think um, it really compels people to a new place. So um, I think that this one was really now let's let's uh, did we get ever, all the comments on here, Virginia, do you want to any for, no, I think further? everything was said. I was just going to add that inspiration is contagious and so is courage. And I think yes. it's what actually also shows up in the, the leaders that you tied together here. Very yeah. courageous leaders. So this is our top 10, um, not in any particular order. I think that all of them are equally on the top rung. Um, but we do have one bonus uh, mention that we want to put out there. And that is um, the... The first responders, the frontline workers, um, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, all of the people who have really been helping us through the last two years. Um, it has been a very challenging time for a lot of people. Those people who have been alone in their apartments, those people who have been on respirators, those people who have lost loved ones, um, those people who have had challenges with their business, uh, all of it has been is very, very difficult and it's been divisive, but these are the people that have been the glue holding our society together. And uh, I think all of us would simply just want to say thank you, but I'll, I'll let each one of you maybe just comment in your own words. What is What does this group of people mean to you? Um, 
you know, I have a lot of people around me from family or friends who are uh, healthcare professionals, who are doctors, nurses, and definitely it's been inspiring to see them um, still go to work with a grateful heart, with the strong desire to want to help, even if it was extremely hard for them, even if their emotional intelligence was definitely challenged on many fronts. Hmm. And I think where it's been a little bit harder for them, based on the conversations I've had, especially with nurses, was making sure that they also think about them. So how do they, you know, this week was Bell Cause, you know, Bell Talk Day. It's a lot about how to make sure that you put your mask on, right, when you're on the plane before you help other people. So how do you take care of yourself also first to make sure that your needs are met so that you can help other people in a very meaningful way. Yeah. And when there was this sense of urgency, I've seen a lot of people sometimes forget themselves. It's not often very discussed how their mental or physical health also was impacted by being those heroes or by showing up even when it was hard to show up. So I think it's important to actually raise awareness um, on the issue of mental health for the healthcare professionals and how you know they should also be supported um, in a way that helps them figure out you know strategies to build resiliency and, uh, and courage is yeah. not really the issue for them. It's, it's mostly resilience and emotional self-awareness that I think is something that needs a little extra support too. Marco, comments, ideas? Very, very similar. I mean, uh, I actually had a cousin pass from COVID, COVID, it was COVID related and just the grace and understanding and compassion that the, the healthcare workers had with the entire family. It just, it just speaks volumes um, with respect to how they're all approaching this. And I have friends from university who are physicians working on the front lines and know, I know of nurses too. And um, just to get that message out there above and beyond that they are appreciated but for them to, and echoing what Virginie said here, to prioritize themselves and their self-care, because this is a group of people by nature that are just naturally caring for other people. And um, they need to take that time to care for themselves. And if we go back to coaching and, and one of our founders, Thomas Leonard, he coined that phrase of, if you have a challenge with the term being selfish, then think of it as the term of being self-full. And the way he coined selfish was, if it's good for me, for others. But if you have a challenge with the word selfish, self-full. Be able to fill yourself first, and then that carries over to others. Oh, I like that a lot. I like that. Ed, any parting thoughts about our, our wonderful yeah, folks sure. who have guided us through? Yeah. I'm so appreciative that this group of people was put on. We've talked a little bit about... The Competency that is in fact not a core competency is conspicuousness. Oh. It's not a competency that be conspicuous. I think the vast majority of leaders are not conspicuous. And here's an example, just an example. Their names generally don't appear in, in the news. Uh, the same piece of features, the same piece of features. Um, there are so many examples of leaders that we could not do with that absolutely make the future of our world. Us. And so just thanks so much for including a, represent a representative subset of we, we were having a few problems uh, hearing the vol your, uh, your voice that it got a little bit digitized in and out, but your point is well taken. The conspic conspicuous nature of how they showed up and they were there. They were in the right place at the right time. Uh, I know for myself, every time I go to the grocery store, I make sure that I thank that person who's there. 
Um, when I'm in the hospitals and the healthcare facilities, I make sure to take the time to intentionally say thank you to these people. I think that all of us, if we all did that, they would feel that love a little bit more. They'd feel the appreciation and our own uh, empathy for what it is that they're going through. And uh, perhaps that would uh, help them along a little bit more. But certainly, uh, you know, no, no major corporation, no backing. Um, these people are out there doing their job every single day at a very, very critical place. And I think it's, it's really helped a lot of us. So that's probably my biggest inspiration in the last year. Um, okay, let's finish off. I want to thank all of you guys for, for being there for us today with your comments, your ideas, your perspectives, absolutely priceless. I really appreciate the different angles that you guys have taken on this. The, the thoughts that you've brought into this, it's been fantastic. A um, couple of quick questions for each one of you. Um, I'm going to start in reverse order. Marco, um, yes. thank you so much for being part of this today. Um, I asked you previously if you could come up with a coach's recommendation. Anything that you want to impart, give to our audience today. Any uh, words of wisdom from Marco Iafredi? Um, I'm actually going to go to my quote, um, and then uh, a book that I really like, um, we cannot teach people anything. We can only help them to discover it. Galileo Galilei. And why that I, I find that inspiring is because it, it goes, when we think about education, leadership, or let's go back to the root word, not to get all philosophical here, but educare, the true meaning of the word to draw out, to bring forth and the true purpose of a coach, of a leader, whatever it may be in that realm there, is to draw out, to bring forth the best in others and, and society. So I love that quote. And if if there's other coaches on here and you just wonder, what is it that is my skill or my drive to draw out from others? And uh, just, just a fantastic book. It's a little older one that I love. It's called Change or Die by Alan Deutschman. And mm -hmm. it talks about three key pieces that can help inspire change. And he calls them the three R's, the relate, the reframe, and the repeat. So the relate is being in the right community that instills hope. Um, just a brief summary of it. The reframe is having that right mental attitude and approach. And then the repeat are the big right actions over time that they become the new norm based on the right community having the right mindset. So just a quick book that I absolutely love that can frame out some things. And that quote of... Uh, drawing out help people to, to discover who they are and and what they love and what they want to bring to this earth fantastic and thank you for everything you brought to our conversation today thank you also a huge thank you to ed Britton, also from calgary ed the not retirement coach helping people who are uh have so much to offer and have so much wisdom and experience um ed what recommendations can you give us uh for our audience well, that quote that I referred to at the beginning is from the comedian George Burns, who people in our generation know well. Yes. Retirement at 65 is ridiculous. When I was 65, I still had pimples. <laughs> <laughs> he said that when he was like 95 or something. Yeah, maybe. I know. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe 130, I don't know. Yeah, I love that. Okay, yeah. so uh, what what are you up to lately? What's going on? What can we look forward to? What's this? Well, this is, and you can see how well used. My here. Uh, purposeful retirement, how to bring happiness and meaning to your retirement by Hiram W. Smith. So, uh, kind of a little bit like a Bible for me. And so there you go. That's my recommendation. Fantastic. Uh, as, as I said, the big priority for me right now is getting the word out, uh, uh, stimulating the movement, not retirement. And so I have a couple of uh, webinars coming up. Um, one is uh, sponsored here in Calgary by Re Resource YYC. It's on Tuesday, February the 15th at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, smarter Goals and the Commitment Equation. And so that one's coming up. Uh, then I have another one on February 22nd, uh, another Tuesday, 5.30 p.m. So that's a little more civilized for people in the East, 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, not Retirement, 
you deserve a better future. And if, if you want to find these, find the link to them, just go to um, notretirement.ca, my website, click on events, and, and they're listed there. Would love to have people. Notretirement.ca. Thank you so much, Ed. I appreciate it. Dr. Virginie Masana, thank you so much for being here with us. Your comments, uh, your perspectives have been invaluable. Uh, what do you have for a coach's recommendation for our audience? Hmm. So I think I have two different types of recommendation. One is based on emotional intelligence. I've been talking a lot about emotional intelligence. I think it can become a bit of a blank statement if you're not guided well enough to know where actually you score in terms of emotional intelligence and what action plan you can practically put in place in order to increase some of those skills that we talked about. So my first recommendation would actually to be to be assessed, right? And get, you know, the help of someone like me or someone else who is certified in EQI to actually get you where you want and increase those skills. And if you want to know more about it, there are some pretty amazing books. Um, the first one that I really like is by Susan David. It's called Emotional Agility. It's been also translated in French uh, for the French-speaking listeners. It's called L'Agilité Emotionnelle. So same titles, ju just translated in, in French. The second one in terms of emotional intelligence that I would recommend is by another doctor, Dr. Mark Brackett, and it's called Permission to Feel. It's really amazing. Dr. Bra Mark Brackett also has a free book club. Each year you can attend online once a week with the author and you're, you know, digging into the book, you're uncovering what it's talking about, you're understanding new things, getting new layers. It's so generous. He's been doing that for years. I attended that book club. I love it. So Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett and Emotional Agility by Susan David are really two books that I recommend. And then the other little recommendation, super mm -hmm. tiny book, because I'm just an avid reader and I have to recommend more books, yeah. is <laughs> one by a very famous author, especially in leadership, called Simon Sinek. You already oh. know, start with why, most probably, but it's not the book I'm going to be recommending. I'm going to be recommending a super tiny book with comic strips that he actually created and it's called Together is Better. And it's actually a book about leadership. It's like a little fable, you know, with quotes, key quotes, something you keep on your bedside table. You can open and be inspired once in a while. It reads like in 30 minutes, but it's full of golden nuggets. I can I can't recommend enough to get that tiny book called Together is Better. It's pretty oh, awesome. Love it. I hadden heard of that one before. And I'm a I know it's not known enough, but fan, it's so, so good. Yeah, that's good. Uh quick, quick funny story here for you. Uh, you know, if you were to ask a, a thousand people, um, are you a below average driver, an average driver, or an above average driver? The vast majority of people will tell you they're an above average driver which doesn't make any sense from a statistical <laughs> point of view, right? The same applies to emotional intelligence. If you tell, if you ask a thousand people, do you have high emotional intelligence average or below? Most people will say they have above average emotional intelligence. My recommendation, if you're wondering, get in touch with Virginie. She will help you with that assessment. My, I'll throw a recommendation out to finish things off. And that is a video that you can find on either the uh, TED channel, TED.com, or you can find it on YouTube. And it's from DeWitt Jones, one of the leading photographers for National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And it's called Celebrate What's Right with the World. Oh, Celebrate yeah. What's Right with the World. You've seen it, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, fantastic really video. Listen, I want to thank you guys again. Really, really great to have you guys on here. I think this has been absolutely marvelous. And it's so good to celebrate something that is inspiring. It's people that are really doing a great job out there leading all of us. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. you. This was awesome. Okay, yeah, that's it for wonderful. today, folks. We are working on some more shows. We should have the founder and CEO of Mastermind Toys coming nice. to us in the next little while. Look out for that one coming in the next few weeks. Thank you, everybody, for showing up, for being part of this. You take care, stay safe, and bye for now. Bye.